Right. Welcome, everyone, to the 2021 Fred Halliday Memorial Lecture. My name is Karen Smith, and I'm the head of the International Relations Department at the LSC. I want to say a few words about this lecture series, and then I'll introduce our distinguished speaker. The Fred Halliday Memorial Lecture Series celebrates the life of Professor Fred Halliday, a world-leading Middle East scholar, IR theorist, analyst of global affairs, and public intellectual. Fred joined the International Relations Department in 1983 and became the Montague Burton Professor of International Relations in 2005. He was elected Fellow of the British Academy in 2002. In 2008, he left the LSE for a post at the Barcelona Institute of International Affairs, though he still returned to the LSE to give lectures. On the 26th of April 2010, Fred died of cancer in Barcelona. Fred strongly defended justice, human rights, and democratic values, and cosmopolitanism. He was an accomplished linguist, a prolific author, and a pioneer at the LSE in establishing the Middle East Center, and together with Professor Margot Light, the teaching of gender and international relations. He was a fantastically supportive teacher and mentor. And in the chat, there's a link uh, to a website where you can learn more about his uh, life and some tributes that have been said uh, that were written about him. Tonight's lecture is given by another towering figure in the study of the Middle East. Professor Charles Tripp from SOAS, University of London, where actually Fred did an MA a degree. Um, and Charles is Professor Emeritus of Politics with reference to the Middle East and North Africa, and also a fellow of the British Academy. His research interests include the nature of autocracy, state and resistance in the Middle East, the politics of Islamic identity, and the relationship between art and power. He's currently working on a study of the emergence of the public and the rethinking of Republican ideals in Tunisia. The title of his lecture is From Subject to Citizen and Back, Crises of the Republic. He's going to speak for approximately 45 minutes and will then answer questions uh, from the audience. Please use the Q&A button to submit uh, your questions and state your name and affiliation when you do so. There are instructions in the chat I can see right, uh, right now. If you're a Twitter user, the hashtag for this event is hashtag LSE Halliday. So without further ado, I hand the floor over to Professor Charles Tripp. Welcome, thanks very much. Aaron, thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you to all of those who tuned in. As you'll probably guess quite quickly after a few minutes of this, I've never lectured to Zoom before, so I hope I come across fairly clearly, but I really wanted to thank uh, the Karen and the International Relations Department at uh, LSE, but also, of course, the Fred Halliday Annual Lecture Organizing Committee for the kindness of inviting me uh, the, this evening. Um, I should say at the beginning, uh, Karen uh, described my lecture title accurately. Uh, this is not going to be a lecture in international relations. I don't know how to say this, and I hope I'm suddenly not going to be muted because I've said the wrong thing to the wrong people. but. Uh, what I take my cue from in this lecture are a couple of things. Part of it is from Fred Halliday's work uh, itself, and I think there are two recurring themes uh, in his writings that uh, I've taken inspiration from and, and in many ways will help to inform uh, ideas in the lecture this evening. One is uh, Fred's fascination of the relationship between ideology and practice, and particularly the transformative power of practices uh, informed but not dictated by ideologies. Uh, and looking at that, the processes of mutual constitution uh, and change at work. And what seemed to interest him greatly, and myself as well, is the practices that transmit ideas by whom and in what settings. But he was also interested in that uh, by looking at the analytical power of comparing practices rather than get distracted by the magnificent richness of different ideas is to think about how practices can be quite similar. And I think he made a, a, a very important point in that. And for all of us working on looking at the politics of any region at all is to realize that the region you're working on is not unique in and of itself. That politics uh, occurs in many different forms, but has logics that uh, transfer, trans, uh, transfer themselves from one region to another. So. I think, again, uh, in Fred's work, looking at the unexceptionalism 
of uh, the Middle East, North Africa region and how it's more similar to as parts of the global North and South. So that's one set of ideas which uh, and themes that came out of it that have informed the lecture this evening. And the other is uh, Fred's uh, interest in solidarity and particularly in uh, Republican solidarity as a practice that uh, informed by concepts of equality and liberty. But of course, he was aware of the tensions within it, particularly in terms of practice and between the universalism of republicanism and the actuality of state-based republics. But he was also concerned and wrote uh, extraordinarily interestingly about it, the effective power of ethnicity and the nation and the limits that this might place on Republican solidarity in practice, particularly in the complex solidarity implied by a Republican idea of global citizenship. So in many senses, although I don't claim in any sense to be working in international relations, uh, I think many of the insights that Fred provided have been inspiration for those of us working in comparative politics, political sociology, as well as uh, uh, international relations also. But the other, uh, if you like, origin of this talk comes from my own work in Tunisia. Um, and what interested me was the ways in which Tunisians had thrown off decades of subjugation. Um, countering uh, what uh, Beatrice Ibu rather wonderfully called the force of obedience with another kind of force that is disobedient insurgent force, uh, which you could hear in the cries of Erhal, Degaj, uh, get away, go away, uh, that was so common in the Tunisian revolution of 2010, 11. And so what one saw in Tunisia and has continued to see is the power of activist citizens informing alert, multi-voiced publics, but also of course their vulnerabilities. And so the challenges facing insurgent citizens in refounding the Republic has been a constant concern as well. And a concern of uh, friends and in Tunisia and those who are trying to make things work in Tunisia. So those two areas, if you like, the origins of the, of the talk, Fred's thinking about um, the ideas and practice, thinking about solidarity and my own work on Tunisia has combined to produce some reflections and some arguments, which I hope to uh, develop this evening, um, mostly in relation to uh, the Middle East and North Africa, but with a few words before about the themes that I'll be pursuing. Um, first of all is the, the question that it raises immediately to understand the production of the citizen from the subject, as the title suggests. And both as an imagined set of concepts, but also as embodied practices. And as we know, the term and the word subject has its ambiguities in English, although it should be said in many other languages, including Arabic, uh, there are a whole array of different words to uh, express the different meanings of subject uh, that are included within the English uh, term itself. And I can't help feeling that this is the moment when uh, had Fred been speaking, he would have given a wonderful uh, exposition of the multiple meanings of uh, subject in Arabic and in Turkish and in Persian. I don't have that linguistic facility, but I know that in Arabic there are multiple meanings. Uh, they express different ways in which an individual may be subject to the power of another, not all of them with negative associations, but nevertheless in English, um, subject has come to mean two very different sorts of uh, understanding of the person. One is the notion of the subject as the subject to power, the sense of being subjected to the domination of others. Uh, and the other is the subject of power, that is subjectivity and the self-conscious sovereign subject of the acting individual. Um, and what interests me in the title as well is to see and to analyze the move from one to the other. How does one break the imaginative and material hold of domination and assert the right to have or to claim rights and seen by many as the definition of citizenship. And this means, of course, examining acts of citizenship, their scope, the spaces in which they take place, and particularly to examine the trajectories of the Republic as the imagined and actual institutional space in which to realize citizenship and defend it. So what I'm trying to uh, make are two different kinds or two related arguments. One is about the co-constitution of the citizen and the public, and the second is about the problem that may uh, attend the realization of the republic in the development of the state, and particularly the nation state. So in the first, the co-constitution of the citizen and the public, um, I think 
what one thinks about are the ways in which there are inbuilt tensions and contradictions with no guarantee of success or irreversible progress. And that's the title of my talk, which was uh, from subject to citizen and back again. But it comes out of, in many senses, of the individuals, individuals encounter with the other that recognize themselves in key ways. Uh, this encounter has often been seen as being the foundation of politics and for uh, Schmidt, for instance, uh, it was the friend enemy distinction, the basis of all politics, but I would argue also that the encounter can also evoke ideas of solidarity across difference, acting them out not simply in alliances, but also in agonistic exchanges you know, where they differ with each other. And from this emerging a common understanding how, how all stand in relation to the constituted power and a growing awareness of their potential in combining to assert their rights. So from this one sees how citizenship and solidarity form an emerging public that gives birth to the idea of the Republic and enacts it continually, bringing a distinctive understanding of the political, for instance, to remove subjection to arbitrary power, to embody self-rule and sovereignty as expressions of the rights of citizenship. In other words, politics should be the public's business guaranteeing citizens participation to create the framework for a community of equal citizens to give expression to a common good, a public good over and above particular interests that fosters solidarity, and to ensure that politics is conducted in public, subject to scrutiny by the public, uh, and hence the notion of democratic accountability. However, these are powerful ideas and they've emerged from experiences that have been uh, uh, common in many parts of the world, but they also, of course, realize uh, the practices of their realization in politics in specific places have brought out the tensions inherent in them. And some of these have become apparent in some of the developments I'll be talking about uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. First of all, constituting the public is an important part of the operation, as it were, but with it should go the need to recognize its plural nature. In other words, the demos, the people, the public is not uniform, uh, nor should it be assumed to be unanimous. But the challenge has often lied, Elaine, in how to accommodate differences and which differences, and therefore the emergence of counter publics. Uh, secondly, there's the question of how to ensure that the spaces for the development of an agonistic politics of challenge and contestation fall within a common understanding of the political. And again, one could argue the fragility of this in practice has been demonstrated uh, over and over again in many places. Thirdly, there's the question of inequality and the obstacles to full participation, the shakiness, in other words, of Republican citizenship with based on deep inequalities of gender, race, wealth, or status. And finally, uh, a problematic question which has emerged, which is how to move from the horizontal relations of citizenship to the vertical relations of power, and fears, therefore, that new kinds of domination if the horizontal solidarities are undermined and hierarchies of command prevail. So I can begin to think about the ways in which citizenship and the enactment of citizenship has produced the public and suggested the Republic as a form of organization, but this also uh, raises the problem of how to realize that in practice. And in particular, it raises the troubled question of the state and particularly the nation state and its relationship to the Republic, because one of the things that one sees very quickly is that in many ways, some of the problems that I identified have been sharpened by the uh, establishment of the state and the nation state. So uh, assumed uniformity or identity of the sovereign people, which has often been part of the foundational documents of the public, of, of the Republic and of the state, we the people, uh, as the incarnation of the public, but what this might mean for the consequences for toleration, let alone encouragement of difference, for the recognition of plural publics and the rights of diverse citizens. And particularly, of course, for the part that it may play in the primacy of the nation as an identifying community, a powerful, but also an exclusive determinant of belonging and of uh, exclusion. The second problem that emerges sometimes with the understanding of republicanism in relation to the state, which is the boundaries of the state and the limits of citizenship. In other words, the limits of solidarity practices and the effects of the imagination of the rights of republican citizenship 
if unlinked from a particular republic as a state. And one could argue that uh, Hannah Arendt was prescient in her fear of the implications of this for the dehumanization of the stateless individual. And again, one doesn't look, need to look too far to see how that has been played out in practice. Thirdly, there's the question of how the Republic as a state becomes the arbiter, an instrument of hierarchical power. And there in practice, how can the horizontal solidarities of citizenship underpinning the public be sustained in the vertical organization of the state? How best can that public control the state? And often that led to, and uh, it's been part of the problem of the state's relationship to the citizen, is the recasting of the meaning of citizen to become a category for inclusion and for order rather than for activism and creativity. So you get the, uh, uh, the, the thinnest meaning, the formality of the passport identification, citizenship uh, expressed by whatever passport one happens to hold. But also you have citizenship more insidiously as a model of conformity, the notion of the good citizen, the model citizen, or even uh, in my colleague Selva Ismail's forensic study of, of Syria, the wanted citizen, that is the citizen not so much desired as always wanted for questioning, uh, the citizen under the uh, watchful eye of the administrative state. And it brings in the question of the administrative logic that ensures citizenship fits the individual into the dominant order, whatever that might be, and however construed. And finally, there's the question of state violence, which actually hasn't featured very much in Republican theory at all, uh, uh, but has certainly featured in the practice of republics. So it changes the balance of power between the insurgent and the republic and has clearly been uh, a feature of uh, the ways in which states have behaved. So what I want to try and do uh, in the rest of the talk is to think of some of those themes and some of the tensions that they allude to and indeed some would argue some of the fateful logic that they embody, uh, to use them by looking at examples from across the Middle East and North Africa, but to argue that although I may be looking at Middle East and North Africa, these are in fact more global features of the ways in which Republican ideals have materialized. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the tensions and contradictions that they provide also provide incentives and spaces for insurgent citizenship. So these are the two forces one could argue working dialectically upon each other, not just in the Middle East and North Africa, but that's what I should be looking at uh, for the rest of the talk this evening. In terms of the historical imagination of the Republic uh, as an instrument of emancipation, uh, it was very evident uh, from the 19th century onwards in uh, the Middle East and North Africa, emancipation from colonial rule, but also from much else besides, that is the Republic was going to free people from despotism, from class domination, from elite rule, from patriarchy. And if one looks across the writings of those periods of the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, you see a coherent but very diverse set of ideas articulated across the Middle East and North Africa. The thinkers of Anahda in the Arab world, of the young Ottomans in Ottoman Turkey and beyond, thinking beyond colonial occupation and in many cases beyond dynastic rule, thinking about the Republic as the way in which this could be realized and having in common the notion of the people as the foundation of the sovereign republic, a sovereign people and self-rule. And with it, of course, a close connection between the identification of the people and citizenship, even if for many of those writings, certainly in the late 19th century, uh, there was a rather restricted view about who should be a citizen or what the full rights of citizenship should uh, should uh, or who should enjoy them. Uh, it was limited by class position, by gender, by age, by location. For some, it was seen as a status to be achieved and some to be uh, defended and to exclude others from it. But if there was recognition that there was difference between an elite, an enlightened elite who would lead people to the full development of the Republic and the unenlightened masses who would follow them uh, willingly towards it, uh, the sense of trying to bridge that difference was through a common atta attachment to country. Uh, hence, of course, in Arabic, the uh, word for citizen of uh, is uh, directly related to the word for fatherland, for country, for al-watan. Uh, um, 
So the common benefits of citizenship and republican institutions would come, but they would come hierarchically uh, dispensed by those who were fellow citizens, but effectively controllers of the Watton. For others, however, the power of the activist citizen forged in the anti-colonial struggle should continue against all forms of established power. Uh, but this, of course, played out very differently in different countries. And one of the things that became apparent was, of course, that uh, as in many other parts of the world, it was quite difficult to separate the emerging idea of the, of the nation from citizenship itself, uh, from public interests and rights. In the Arab world, this was complicated by a particular tension of what one might say the unrealized republic of the Arab nation and the actual republics of the individual Arab states, which continued to be, and to some extent continues to be, uh, a feature and sometimes a disruptive feature of uh, the politics of the Middle East and North Africa. And what it meant in many ways, of course, was the rapid foregrounding of the state itself. So for the realities of post-colonial republic and its subject citizens that uh, was produced, uh, a number of things became apparent. And there are things which in many senses, the uprisings that we witnessed uh, 10 years ago uh, were uprisings against, and there had been previous uprisings too. The first was that the Republic, as constituted in this uh, post-colonial order, was demanding a single unified public, a people, uh, which was often claimed to be embodied in one leader. There's no room here, therefore, for the activist citizen of the anti-colonial movements. Uh, no room at all for the activist citizen potentially expressing difference or dissent. And yet behind this uniformity, what was apparent too, not always so apparent, but often quite disguised, but nevertheless known, was discrimination and exclusion, where indeed the principles of state governance based on class, on Schiller, on elites, on sub-networks of the shadow state, it was a terrible caricature in some ways of the plural society that really did exist. Severe inequalities of opportunity granted privilege as only to those who belong to particular groupings. Formal citizenship was not enough. So citizenship itself in these post-colonial republics became more restricted and hollow as space for the political shrank, creating a disciplinary view of the citizen as an administrative category with diminishing rights, if any, and subject to arbitrary power. The Republic in this sense was equated with the state. It was the prize to be won based on narrow foundations of privileges. There were classes of citizen in terms of differential privileges and a buildup of resentment against the ruling order, but also most corrosively a resentment against those who were more favored, fracturing any notion of a public uh, in uh, a, an activist sense. And with behind this and above this was the shadow state corrupting and subverting the Republic from within. So organized inequality became an embedded and enacted principle of power. Patronage, the creation of client followings, the expropriation of public wealth for private purposes, corruption, family privileges, as well as organized violence, both structural and overt, reinforced these inequalities of wealth, gender, ethnicity, religion, and birth. And in these circumstances, there was increasing identification of the Republic with a state, a nation state, an administrative state with no room for the practices of citizenship that did not conform to authoritarian rules, a shadow state, which is in many sense, the antithesis of the res publica and acting in its name, nevertheless, to prevent expression and to repress difference. So it's not altogether surprising, therefore, that uh, this, form of order in which citizenship had been denied, in which the public had been homogenized uh, by disciplinary method, was to be the target of resistance and subversion. And in many ways, what one witnessed 10 years ago was the ways in which the insurgent citizen and the re-emergence of the public reclaim, reclaimed the Republic or tried to reclaim the Republic. So one can see the Arab uprisings as a reassertion of the activist citizen, uh, emerging from multiple forms of resistance, resentment, suppressed difference, resistance learned and practiced for many years 
not always observed and not always coming together, but in 2010, 2011, coming together across the region. And I would argue that was in some respects because the experience of subjection, of being a subject in the sense of subject to power, had made activists citizens of all. It had created solidarities within countries and across countries, and these were immediately understood. It had produced similar tropes, slogans, performances, even common resonances with anti-colonial mobilizations. One of the notorious features of many of the uprisings was the fact that the flag that had flown over these countries for the previous 30 or 40 years was simply disappeared. And what re-emerged was the flag of the anti-colonial struggle uh, in Syria in Libya uh, and elsewhere. And in fact, even one of those who was a participant on the other side, Kamal Benzouri, the Prime Minister of Egypt, 2011, 2012, made reference to this. He'd been appointed by the military committee that ran Egypt at the time. And he complained of being shunned by everyone. He said, as if I were a representative of the British colonial occupation. Well, in many senses, this was the acknowledgement that what had emerged in the period of uh, post-colonial rule had been something that looked like, if not a colonial, then a military occupation of many of the countries. The ways in which the Republic in being equated with the state had become an instrument of domination, creating subjects, not citizens. And so in many senses, therefore, the enacting insurrectionary citizenship created an activist public. The battle for public space and the visible denial of an imposed order were performances intended for multiple audiences. But they were also, I would argue, performative in driving the process of self-constitution of the citizen and the public. Uh, there was the novelty of acting as a public, witnessing how disparate individuals or groups could constitute themselves into a collective body that had power, but also claimed citizens' rights, reappropriating spaces long ago seized by rulers of the security state. And by performing the public, these people were establishing a counter system of order and symbolic or imaginative power using public space to assert at least the lineaments of the new republic. And at various moments in 2011, uh, one saw this briefly uh, ex uh, enacted and performed in different places, uh, as some people have talked about the Republic of Tahrir in Cairo, uh, or indeed uh, the Republic of Change Square in Sana'a in Yemen, uh, in Clock Tower Square in Homs, uh, the brief flowering of, as it were, the Republic of Public Manifestation. Uh, and in the Qasbah in Tunis, which had more effect in bringing down the governments that had tried to ensure the continuity of the pre-revolutionary regime. But these were all limited in space and time. And it was a particular moment in time, commemorated now 10 years on, but which, as we know, gave way to a very different set of processes. So in some senses, it reinforces the question that the uh, movement from subject to citizen is not inevitable, it is not irreversible. And one of the features one has witnessed in the past 10 years in many places is that it has been reversed. And it's been reversed for a number of reasons. Um, I think, first of all, there's the question of the challenge of how does an insurgent public uh, move from that insurgency to a constituted republic? and therefore also a republic not necessarily constituted by them. This is the move from citizen to subject. First of all, as became very evident in many of the countries of the uprisings was that the fragmentation of the public uh, persisted and in some ways, is, some ways got worse. The inequalities were unaddressed and uh, the public uh, that had been so solid in some senses, uh, in the early months or weeks of the uprisings, began to fragment. And partly this was, of course, the difficult balance between the diversity of citizens and the fragmentation of the idea of the public. How to sustain a common idea when such difference of opinion and difference of interest emerges. There were, of course, ideological calls for unity in the name of national security, of Islam, of the people but often there were the practicing uh, the, of the rules of exclusion on the basis of gender, of sect, ethnicity, class, and region. Uh, 
that suddenly uh, it became apparent or not so suddenly over time it became apparent that there were criteria for inclusion uh, in the people or in the public that certain citizens did not match and on that basis they were excluded and of course there were the forces of the security state that had not gone away and wanted to dilute the reality of public power anyway to ensure that it remained toothless as in the popular assemblies the republics the jamahariyas of the previous 50 years to exclude in other words significant sections of the population narrowing it down and actively encouraging uh, fragmentation and equally uh, as became apparent the public performances of resistance and insurrection often helped to reinforce the security state in many senses they dealt more effectively and certainly ruthlessly, and it was in an idiom that they understood when violence was used against them that they themselves had provoked. Uh, one has seen the playing out of that in Syria in horrific ways over the last 10 years. So the double-edged impact of the strategies of disorder that had been so effective in bringing about the paralysis of the old security state often now reinforced it. It was used as an asset for those seeking to close debate, to narrow options, to transform a plural public into one. And equally, of course, the familiar performances of protest and insurrection were subject to the rules of dramatic decay. That is that performance through repetition can create a fever of anticipation, but also boredom and a cynical distance from the performance itself. So one has witnessed, therefore, the return of the security state, the securitization of the Republic, the disciplining of the citizen as subject, the re-establishment, as some put it, of uh, the fear of the regime, the Haufenism, under the guise of the awe of the state, the Hebet Adola that had evaporated during the uprisings and achieved through violence and uh, violent deterrence. And this, in a, many senses, is the shape and the way in which the subject citizen is now being shaped by the security regimes uh, and the securitization of the Republic, undermining their political subjectivity, bringing them back as subjects to power, not subjects of power. Even in Tunisia, where one might say that active, activist citizens have freer scope than in many parts of the uh, Middle East and North Africa, uh, there have been concerns of the impulse to achieve such a securitization of the Republic as well. The 2015 anti-terror law, which is much criticized, especially for its very broad definition of terrorism, but also the fear of politicians' uh, profligate use of the state of emergency uh, since 2015 and the unreconstructed attitudes in the Ministry of Interior, many of which have been visible uh, in the ferocious po police responses to the protests and demonstrations of the unemployed uh, in the last few months. So the reinforcement or the reestablishment of the security state has become part of the uh, move from citizen to subject uh, once again, to reestablish the contours of the ways in which the uh, citizen becomes uh, a hollowed out or administrative category uh, and in which citizenship is reduced to certain formal uh, lineaments rather than to any activist uh, possibilities. Nevertheless, one might say this is a continuing dialectic, not one that just disappears with uh, one set of assertions, just as the uprisings were met by the reinforcement or the reassertion of the counter-revolutionary security state, the securitization of the state and the diminishing of citizens' rights. So of course, uh, resistance, insurgency and activist citizenship uh, continue. And one's seen that on a number of different scales uh, in the last few years. Uh, there have been the uprisings in Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Algeria and Sudan many sharing many similar characteristics uh, for, of those of 2010-11, and in many senses following the same logic, uh, the same targets of outrage, theft, corruption, repression, violence, the privatization of what should be public, the lack of rights, the lack of participation, the lack of jobs, uh, as well as, of course, the age profiles of the demonstrators themselves. So in Iraq and Lebanon, uh, 
there have been the activist citizens rising up against the division of the public and the division of the spoils by those who profit most from the Mahasasa system of communal representation. And the calls in both countries, Iraq and in Lebanon, to refound the Republic on a different relationship between citizen and state, unmediated by sectarian categories or by communal oppression of one form or another. Um, so it's an echo, one might say, in the particular settings of Iraq and Lebanon of the kinds of calls that one heard in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, in Syria, and in Yemen uh, in 2011. And equally in Sudan and Algeria, uh, here the protests have been and the uprisings have been and the performance of public insurgency has been against military and security establishments and the appropriation of public wealth by the military. And again, here in both countries, you hear the calls to refound the Republic on a different relationship between citizen and state, making the security forces the servants of the citizen rather than the other way around. But just as these have been powerful examples of the ways in which the logic of resistance and the uh, possibilities of the insurgent citizen remain very much alive within the politics of the Middle East and North Africa, so one's also had the chance to see what one might call the enactments of republics through enacted citizenship in distinct and rather poor, more limited spaces in the last 10 years. To take two contrasting examples, in Syria, a country racked by civil war, as we know, one has seen the emergence of something that looks like a republic uh, in Rojava, in the Kurdish northeast of Syria. Ethnic solidarity, but much more than that, uh, a mobilized citizenship and a notion of mobilizing citizenship based on ideas of equality, of gender, of wealth, uh, and based on cooperative agriculture. It's a precarious republic, both from without, given the neighborhood it lives in, and from within. But the impulse to create a more meaningful uh, activist citizenship uh, has certainly been there in northeastern Syria and Rojava. In other parts of Syria, sadly now all disappeared uh, thanks to the violence of the civil war. One has seen other examples of it. For anyone who plugged into the, the internet, the extraordinary performances and artistic productions of Kafra Nebel in uh, Idlib province from a good eight years, from 2012 to 2020, became very famous, uh, but now sadly dispersed since its reoccupation by the uh, forces of Assad uh, and uh, leaving much of its population stateless and subjected or subjected to its rule. In fact, one of the more distressing and disturbing images of Kafir Nebel now has been the cats of Kafir Nebel uh, because the city, the town itself deserted, uh, the cats have taken back over. So it was a terrible uh, expression of what was once a thriving, active mini republic, you could argue, of activist citizens uh, is something else altogether. And of course, in Syria as well, from the beginning of the uprisings, the emergence of local coordination committees, which uh, emerged in about 70 or 80 of them across the country, uh, under the slogan of freedom, dignity and citizenship, became the basis of civic authorities. But again, most, if not all, have been swept away in violence uh, of the civil war. But the impulse was there, and one might say the memory is there, and it leaves a legacy of sorts, as well as a kind of expression of the resilience of the human spirit in looking to become the subject of its own destiny rather than the subject to the power of others. And from the other uh, uh, extreme, you might say, uh, in the outcomes of the uh, uprisings of Tunisia, where the frustrations of the constituted republic have indeed opened up spaces for the possibility of insurrectionary citizenship. And one's seen it in at least three examples in uh, Tunisia over the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, in the island of Kerkene, for example, um, the uh, case of uh, uh, the inhabitants of Kirkana enacting citizenship through protest and mobilization against the British-owned oil companies that have been uh, 
inflicting environmental costs uh, through its extractive oil industry and a lack of jobs met by repression uh, and uh, of the Tunisian authorities and then resistance uh, and self-organization by the inhabitants of Kokona <clears throat> who were so effective in throwing the armored cars into the sea of the island that uh, the attempted repression has not been attempted again and other forms of negotiation have taken place. But the point is that the uh, enactment of citizenship uh, has clearly been something which, despite the re-establishment of the Tunisian Republic, is something that the inhabitants of Kokona feel have, has expressed something that they were not getting from the national revolution or the national re-establishment of the Second Republic. And one might argue <clears throat> a similar uh, set of impulses, if not exact outcomes, in Kamur, the sit-in and occupation at the oil pumping station in the south, for quite similar reasons, enacting citizenship through protest and refusal, but also through self-organization and solidarity. And also in Jemna, uh, we're again in a, uh, a, uh, an area in the interior of uh, Tunisia, uh, the interior and south, which often get much neglected uh, historically and have been since the revolution as well, where the farmers have occupied and self-organized to exploit the land of Jemna, which ironically was dispossessed by the French. Uh, they were dispossessed by the French in 1912, uh, and it was never returned to them under the uh, independent Republic of Bourguiba. Uh, but in the Revolutionary Committee of 2011, uh, they enacted uh, citizenship, one might argue, against both neoliberal and state degradation of the lands and have reoccupied the lands and have put them to productive use. So again, in that example, there is a sense in which the impulses to reestablish a meaningful citizenship that has meaning for them as the farmers of uh, a disadvantaged area of the interior has been a key part of the reactivation of citizenship and the emergence from being simply subject to an, uh, an order that they regard as not something, not one that has taken their own interests into uh, consideration. So those I hope have given some examples of the ways in which uh, some of the larger themes at the beginning that I talked about have played out in, uh, a rather sweeping scope of Middle East North African uh, political history. But I just want to wind up with a few conclusions. They're not really conclusions as such, but I suppose outlines of continuing struggles in concepts and practices relating to citizenship, the public and the Republic itself. The first of course is the fact that, uh, and this becomes clear in many of the examples that I was talking about, the citizen subject distinction is ambivalent, it's an ongoing struggle. In some cases it's clear, uh, that is where the reality of subjection and the denial of rights are manifest. Then you can say a subject uh, as in the sense of someone subjected to the domination of others exists and the attempt to uh, break out of that to uh, become uh, a citizen of a, a republic becomes uh, in a meaningful way becomes a, an activist and insurrectionary task. But in other cases, that distinction isn't always as clear cut. So for instance, where a citizen is subject of their fate, but also subject to laws made by others, which in a sense, many of us are anyway. But one needs to think about what is that relationship within ourselves as subject in two senses uh, that combine uh, the notion of subject of, but subject to as well. But also it's apparent where the denial of rights are unseen, but real enough for those whose difference has made them less visible, less able to participate, even if otherwise having formal citizenship. So in which case they may be citizens, but are they citizens in the full sense of the word that uh, I've been seeking to use? Uh, and also of course, where the reality of citizenship encompasses multiple meanings with implications for the rights of individuals. So therefore it seems to me, important to focus on where those struggles emerge. That is thinking about the quality of creative input. Do the laws truly embody self-rule for all? Uh, and here the questions of representation and democracy come up. And is the insurrectionary potential of citizenship taken into account, not merely suppressed? So looking at citizenship as a potentially 
disobedient and indeed creating the potential for disobedience seems to me as much part of the task of that Republican realization of Republican possibilities as any other. The second, uh, which is the, uh, which came out in the examples that I talked about, which is the difficulties of citizenship often caught between the logic of state and the requirements of an imagined republic. That is citizenship caught between the horizontal notions of solidarity, equality, and the vertical, between the potential for insurrection and the demands of order. On the one hand, the question of vigilance by citizens, but also the need for spaces and capacities for self-mobilizations as means of empowerment. But on the other, the privileging of order and an order based on inequality that diminishes the potential of citizenship. And finally, coming to the notion of, uh, and this is my gesture towards the International Relations Department itself, which is the role of the larger order in which the state is enmeshed. I've talked up to now about the state and its intertwining with the Republic, uh, and indeed the uh, ways in which the state has taken over the Republic, and in doing so has often subverted Republican ideals. But the state itself, of course, is enmeshed in a larger international order. And the question here is the degree to which the state is made to answer to a different kind of conformity. Uh, the hegemony and conforming with the hegemonies of great powers or more insidiously of uh, global economies and their orthodoxies. So the Republic as state becomes itself an administrative convenience in this larger system of power, just as the citizen may have become within the state itself. And the effects of this are reproduced, of course, in the material lives of the citizens, limiting their rights, subjecting them to seemingly inescapable forms of domination, but also, of course, provoking insurgency. So all of these trends are apparent in the Middle East and North Africa to varying degrees, as I hope to have brought out. But I would also say that they are elsewhere also apparent to all of us, wherever we are, and we need to be just as aware of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. That was, um, that was an excellent um, and very thought provoking. I kept thinking also of examples around the world that we're, you know, that we're currently seeing of, um, of struggles, uh, you know, in Eastern Europe, um, in Asia and so on. Uh, but there are, we've got a number of uh, questions that have already come in uh, from uh, the audience. So I'm going to um, try to move to them. And what I'm going to do, um, everyone, is I'm going to group these in about uh, three, uh, give Charles about three um, questions to, to address at one time. Um, so uh, let me just, um, uh, I'll start with, um, I'm going to just say people's name. If you've given your um, identification, I'll just say your name and, and, um, uh, and uh, where you're from. Um, so we have a question from an LSE Ideas alumnus, Mohammed, who um, sort of asked, what is the best way to instate the ideal concepts of republic and citizens in the Middle East? through external means or internal means? And what is the probability of success that that could be achieved? Uh, there's a, another question from uh, Wudasi Asfa. How can those subjugated as subjects effectively resist and redefine the structure of the Republic? And then the third uh, question that I'll ask, I'll just group in this um, particular group of questions is um, uh, from Amr Hirmis, uh, who's effectively asking what, um, uh, was it the absence of economic uh, development uh, that, has, that was the principal um, obstacle uh, in this transformation of the subject uh, to citizen, because that also in, in, entailed things like um, a lack of greater participation of women in the economy, society, uh, and politics. So, you know, what, what, how, does, how, how does the economy um, enter uh, into these sorts of, um, uh, into the obstacles to this uh, trans transformation between subject uh, and uh, citizen? So I will um, hand those over to you, Charles, to address as you as you wish, and then we'll, there are lots more questions coming coming in. Okay, that's okay, fine. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much to to all three of you as well for interesting questions, and they're questions that raise a lot of concerns clearly uh, about the ways in which uh, both external and internal 
forces in the Middle East have shaped the politics of the region. Um, on the first question, I would have thought that the lesson of the last, uh, well, <laughs> up an evil number of years is you cannot create the Republic for other people. In other words, that if you do, you create a state, you create something called a Republic, but what you do is of course, uh, deprive any sense of uh, subjective um, determination of their own fate. So it has to be internal. And it has to be internal in the sense that it is not necessarily denied the solidarity of others who can mobilize elsewhere uh, to make causes known, to make uh, cases known. But in structural terms, it has to come from within the society itself, from within the forces at work in that society. Uh, and in therefore, and that relates to the, uh, to the second question, which is about the uh, question of resistance and subjugation. Clearly, one of the things that becomes apparent is that resistance can take many forms. It doesn't always have to be full on confrontation with the, uh, those who control the state. And in fact, sometimes it can have uh, negative consequences as a result, but it, it needs to be, uh, geared to the undermining of the ways in which the state organizes itself or the those within the state organize it and it's a formidable task because clearly that part of the state is very ferocious determined and ruthless in uh, guarding itself and guarding itself against that but the thing it needs to do and this is why i think it's again going back to the first question on the on the internal aspect it has to keep alive and reproduce the possibility that everyone is an active citizen. In other words, it's about how people begin to believe that they have the capacity to change things and that they have uh, a, a moral right to change things and that they can act in concert with each other to change things. So in many senses, acts of resistance may not be immediately obvious in terms of uh, resisting uh, the agents of the state, but they can be acts of resistance if they begin to create another way of thinking about the world, if they create another way of thinking about power, another way of thinking about uh, your contemporaries and your co-citizens. And once you begin to create that, however slow it may take, and, and it takes a long time, uh, it is something that begins to lay the groundwork for reimagining power, because that's really what has to happen. And the relationship between that and economic development is certainly part of it, but it's not so much economic development as such. It's like, it's the question is who is developing it for whose reason? So one of the features of Tunisia, for instance, in the years preceding uh, the overthrow of Ben Ali, was that it was held up as an example of outstanding economic development. Uh, and of course it would also, and this was uh, um, uh, somewhat deceptive on the part of the World Bank and others, uh, claiming that it had a, uh, a growth rate which was exceptional and therefore assuming that the benefits of that growth rate were spread equally across all the population. But two things were not seen. One is the, question that was mentioned before about the um, uh, education of women and the role of women in the economy. Again, one might argue that of all the countries uh, in the Middle East, North Africa, women played, had played historically a far more important part in the economy and the society uh, than in others. And the second was that the disparities and the inequalities of the economic distribution, regardless of the growth rate, were such that they came together. And one might argue that those two features came together to make a revolution. Uh, so there was a sense in which the kind of revolution that developed in Tunisia was possibly partly, not in a, in a mechanically causal way, a result not only of economic deprivation, but also the fact that uh, there were full citizens of the full citizenry. That is that women and as well as men felt that their rights were theirs to lay claim to and that they had been unable to do so under Ben Ali. So there was a sense in which uh, the part played by women in the Tunisian economy was a key part, I would argue, of 
this emergence of the notion of an activist public, an activist citizenship, with an understanding of what the potential might be for constituting a new republic. Great, thank you. Um, so some more questions keep um, um, coming in. So I'm gonna, there's uh, one, one uh, member of the audience has asked uh, two questions and one, one of those questions is linked to another uh, question, uh, very linked. So I'm gonna start with um, those uh, three questions. And the first question then from Muhammad Tafiq Ali is will the COVID-19 pandemic mark for mass popular uprisings in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And then he asks a second question. Uh, are each of Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Libya fragile, failing, or failed states? Um, and can UN involvement avert this? And that question is actually quite linked to a question from Hassan Yaz Yazdi, who asks, um, do you think that we will begin to see a more federalized form of republicanism in Syria and Iraq? And if so, do you think this would lead to the balkanization of the two countries and the rise of exclusive forms of citizenship based upon religious and ethnic identity as opposed to civic identity? I think I'll leave you with those, those three questions and then we've got plenty more coming in. I understood the first question, I, I think you broke up a bit when I was listening to it uh, about the COVID. It was basically, does, does COVID-19 and the, and the pandemic uh, limit the possibilities of popular demonstration uprising? In that's the, correct. Uh, yeah, yeah so, that's correct. Well, clearly uh, it, it's been used as such, not just in um, uh, Iraq and Lebanon, but you could say closer to home, uh, it's been used to, uh, dampen down the possibilities of uh, popular demonstration. I think one of the things that's made it apparent is that uh, clearly for people going out on the streets in uh, Iraq or in, uh, in Beirut or elsewhere, um, the awareness of the risks of the pandemic are, are there because they know what the health condition of the uh, of public health services are, which are diabolical in both countries. Uh, and they're aware of the risk. So I would argue that it doesn't um, dampen down the either the anger or the capacity for mobilization. It just will take different forms. So if you might argue the uh, preeminent form of uh, 2010, 11 was the mass occupation of public space, that has clearly been something which is much harder to achieve now. But and, and harder to achieve if ruthless uh, uh, elimination of people by force is going to be part of the uh, strategy of the regime too. But there are other ways in which you can, as it were, occupy public space. Clearly there is the uh, ways in which that can be done through social media, but also through the ways in which spaces are not necessarily public in terms of a large public open space that can be occupied by thousands of people as a physical, a physical symbolic event, but the ways in which those contacts can be re-established to create spaces of resistance. Spaces of resistance in the sense that they become resistant to the hegemonic ideas of the ruling uh, uh, party or the ruling regime. Uh, and it, going back to what I said in the earlier set of questions was that one can think of the ways in which resistance can be articulated and organized uh, in ways that do not become uh, to make it targets of the regime itself, and yet may be effective in creating solidarities, creating alternative ways of looking at things, creating subversion, uh, and in achieving things that uh, the uh, government itself cannot achieve. So I think that that's, in many senses, what one might see as a redeployment of the strategies or rethinking of the strategies of resistance and protest and insurrection uh, in, in many ways. Um, on the question of the, uh, I, I'd be very wary of fragile and failing states. I think there's always a, a real uh, worry in my mind that these are used to basically stigmatize organizations that don't come up to our own self-estimation or self uh, illusion about what kinds of states we inhabit. So I think one has to be careful and it does alert us to the uh, 
uh, dangers that I referred to in the first lot of questions about external interventions to try and make people, uh, um, as it were, conform to a certain kind of model of what a state should look like. I think in that sense, therefore, uh, the, um, uh, there are certainly things that the United Nations and others can do. There are mediators, there are uh, ways in which parties can be brought together. Uh, there are ways in which um, uh, arms might be um, withheld from areas, but uh, that would be a wishful thinking in many senses. Uh, because of course, states play out their rivalries in territories which they then claim are failing. So there is a sense in which that also becomes part of a, a larger responsibility. But yes, I would say that there are uh, concerns about the degrees of intervention uh, and the problem of uh, according, whether it's Libya or anywhere else, the label of failing state means that either it needs a complete overhaul, in which case external intervention is licensed and we know where that leads, uh, or it uh, disregards the possibility that Libyans, just like anyone else, may come together in different forms to try and organize their futures. Uh, and how that might be assisted rather than imposed. Um, on the question of the, um, uh, the federal republics, well, you could say that um, uh, the question of, I mean, people have often attacked federalism on the basis of balkanization, but of course, balkanization is already there in Iraq. If you look at the way in which the, the state has been divided up, uh, both in terms of offices, of posts, of privileges, uh, and territorially in many senses as well, uh, that has existed uh, since 2003. And in fact, was very many, much part of the recipe for the rebuilding of the Iraqi state as well. And of course, one can't deny that uh, the uh, Kurdish regions of Northeastern Iraq are also uh, see themselves as, as separate in important ways. So federalism has had a curious history in Iraq uh, that it was often seen as a synonym for Kurdish independence and autonomy and therefore was opposed by many other people in the state. Uh, and it had a certain purchase in um, uh, some circles in Iraq as seen, being seen as a vehicle for uh, achieving um, dominance in one part of Iraq or another. I think the point is that whether it's a federal or a unified republic, if the republic is still governed in the way that the state demands conformity, uh, whether it's on a federal basis or in a, a, a unitary basis, it's still going to subvert the republic. And if the state is still governed according to the privileges accorded to uh, people on the basis of uh, the networks of which they belong, then again, you can hardly say that that's whether a federal or unified is going to resolve the problem. So I think in many senses the uh, the localism that one's seen emerging, uh, not to create uh, an alternative version of the Republic, but try to create the spaces for citizenship within local environments is something that one has seen across the region. And one might argue that that's quite an interesting and positive uh, um, development. Of course, localism can also mean the domination of local warlords, uh, as well as uh, the uh, emergence of local coordinating committees. And clearly, uh, localism in and of itself isn't the answer. But there are certainly ways of possibilities of believing that local forms of organization uh, can, uh, under certain circumstances, lead to a more trusted group of. Um, citizenship, or, or citizens rather, uh, cooperating together. But again, that will hugely depend upon the circumstances in which they're operating at the time. Great, thank you. I, there are loads more questions and I, I feel I, I have this horrible sort of feeling that we should have been offering you a wonderful meal afterwards and a lovely reception for everybody just to earn you. I'm afraid, I'm afraid this is just gonna be you know, delayed, I think, delayed. Um, um, uh, a delayed way of uh, expressing our gratitude to you. So several more questions coming in. Um, and I'm gonna group them because there's a group of questions that are sort of um, related to specific uh, countries. So first uh, question comes from someone at the LSE Middle East Center, uh, Madawi al Rasid, um, who says, it seems that the Republic is the framework for the emergence of citizenship, 
albeit this is fraught with difficulties in the Middle East. Am I right to conclude that the absolute monarchies of Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf Emirates and Sultanates have subjects rather than citizens? And then a second question um, uh, specifically with respect to, um, to uh, Tunisia uh, from Youssef Sharif from Columbia Global Centers in Tunisia. Would you call the Hirak in Algeria another citizen attempt to reclaim the Republic, sorry, regarding Algeria, similar to the one we've seen in Tunisia 10 years ago? And we say the same thing about the 2019-2020 uprisings in Iraq. And then final question, which is quite specific to particular uh, states from Caroline uh, Montague. Given the changes in Egypt, since the brief freedoms of the Arab Spring have been profound, could you possibly discuss the changes in the Egyptian state and citizenship since then? So questions on Egypt, uh, Algeria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and the other Gulf Emirates. So over to you with the promise of delayed, uh, some sort of delayed uh, measure of gratitude later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, it's very nice to hear of three people who I know well. So Madawi, Yusuf, and Caroline, very good to hear from you. Uh, if not your voices, then at least uh, to hear your questions. Madawi, I, I, I think one of the things that strikes me is that when you're looking at the, um, the notion of citizenship in the monarchies, um, it's not very different from the thin down notion of citizenship that you get in many of the other republics. So what one has seen in fact is a convergence whereby citizenship for in many of the republics as well as in the monarchies is a purely formal designation. It means a passport. Um, it doesn't mean rights. It doesn't mean any of the kinds of things I was talking about in terms of the, um, or in terms of the um, uh, potential, if you like, uh, for what I would regard as truly Republican citizenship. Uh, and in fact, um, in uh, many places, I think in the Emirates and elsewhere, uh, there are classes for creating good citizens. And this, is, of course, is the point of how to make model citizens that keep the state as it is and the social order as it is going. Uh, so uh, the notion of the model citizen, the notion of the uh, uh, obedient citizen uh, have clearly been useful instrumental devices in, uh, in the monarchies, uh, just as they have been in many of the republics. And I think what that underlines is the sometimes problematic notion of citizenship itself that we ourselves have to uh, uh, think about in using the term uh, that when we talk about the citizen, are we talking about the conformity or are we talking about the insurrectionary potential of the citizen? I think, although many of the uh, features I was talking about have pertained to particular countries, one might argue that this is a problem to think about more generally in terms of uh, how we think about citizens and citizenship. But I think your question about uh, brings it out quite well that frankly, who can tell the difference between if you're a citizen of Saudi Arabia or a citizen of the Emirates or a citizen of Egypt, frankly, uh, in, in terms of the regime, in terms of the governance, uh, you're the same kind of thing, a subject called a citizen. Um, in Yusuf, I think in terms of Algeria and Iraq, I would argue that yes, in many ways, the uprisings that one has seen in uh, the last few years in both Algeria and Iraq have a lot in common with what happened in 2010, 11 in Tunisia and elsewhere. Uh, the outcomes, of course, will be different as they're bound to have been, but the uh, impulse to, uh, to join in association, to perform opposition, uh, to uh, enjoin forms of sol solidarity, and of course, to protest against very similar kinds of things, which is about, domination, uh, unresponsible power, um, violence of those who rule, uh, appropriation of public funds. Both in Algeria and Iraq, I would argue, there is a strong notion amongst those who are, up, who are protesting about what the public should look like and what are public goods and what 
in a sense, the Republic should be and what a public space should be and what public accountability should be. So the only way of enforcing public accountability is to form yourself as a public on the streets or elsewhere of Baghdad or Algiers or Iran or elsewhere uh, and uh, seek to enforce it in those terms. But so in many ways, that's not very different to what was happening in, Algeria, in uh, Tunisia and in Egypt in 2011. On the question of Egypt, I think one of the features of the past um, post-2013 um, sets of developments has been exactly as I described, the reimposition of the security state, uh, a state which is far more inquisitive uh, and unforgiving about dissent uh, than its predecessor was even, uh, a state that demands uh, uniformity and conformity, uh, and a state that expects that if you are a citizen of Egypt, you should therefore unanimously support the government of Egypt. And clearly that's something that not all Egyptians do, uh, but to express yourself against that is become an increasingly dangerous thing to do. So the, uh, the title of my talk from subject to citizen and back uh, applies very strongly, I would argue, to Egypt uh, after 2010. And uh, following on from that, actually quite quite related and definitely from somebody uh, that you do know, um, another one that you know, Toby Dodge, uh, one of your former students and of course a professor in the, the department. Uh, and his uh, question uh, is as follows. The heroes of your talk are the activist insurgent citizens, but in the struggle to shape the Republican field, how much of the population do they speak for? What resources can they mobilize to stand any chance of overcoming the security state or exposing the shadow state? And what are the circumstances that insurgent symbolic capital can overcome the coercive capital of the state's elite? Actually, there were three questions uh, posed in that <laughs> one. Um, but uh, but I got one, one more set of questions from um, Inna Rudolph at King's College uh, who asks, how do you anticipate citizens in the Middle East to adjust their activism and defend their right to express discontent against the state of the Republic, especially where ruling classes use penal codes to suppress any form of criticism against their exploitation of state institutions? We currently see elites claiming to act as defenders of the state's prestige in order to exclude citizens from the decision-making process. So two quite linked um, uh, questions there about possibilities um, of, of, um, of success of, of the citizens, the incumbent citizens. Over to you. Yeah, they're, uh, Toby, hello. Uh, and uh, they are challenging questions to say the least, because of course they uh, anticipate that um, I might have some answer for the people who find themselves in the conditions that they're in at the moment uh, to try and combat the, the power of the security state uh, and the ruthlessness of it as well. And I think that when one looks at the kind of bravery that uh, must be exemplified by those who seek to publicly stand up to uh, the uh, security state, wherever it happens to be, and the resources, both legal and extra legal, that are used uh, to suppress dissent, then it, it's very difficult for somebody standing outside to say, well, you should do this better, you should do that. And so I'd be very wary of that. But certainly, I take your point that there is a problem that the uh, symbolic capital, uh, which one might argue they can work on, and that they can cultivate uh, has not the same short-term efficacy as the uh, material capital of either the instruments of violence or the instruments of corruption and so or patronage and so in that sense it's a very difficult thing to face up to uh, and to say that the heroes as it were uh, would work or would uh, succeed against it. However, I go back to, I think, something that I was saying right at the beginning, where my understanding is that the ways in which resistance is developed is not necessarily by taking the uh, 
agents of the state on head on, or even necessarily by um, uh, combating the local agents of the state uh, in any very obvious way, but effectively by undermining it through associational life insofar as that's possible. But again, associational life, as we know, in the very same places is uh, policed and, uh, and uh, um, uh, ensured that it, it becomes very difficult to operate in some form. So one's up against the same kind of problem that one could imagine uh, facing those who've had to face uh, ubiquitous and inquisitive and ruthless uh, uh, state agencies in other places. So my feeling is that the that, that is possible if people are able to maintain amongst themselves a sense of solidarity that is aware of external uh, links, but not necessarily in any sense uh, uh, acting in collusion with them, because that becomes part of the problem, but is aware that there is an audience out there uh, which can possibly uh, publicize their cause uh, insofar as it might be useful to do so. There's also the question of the internal solidarities amongst the people themselves who have to combat often the ways in which uh, the uh, regime's rule, which is not simply by um, force and intimidation, although that becomes a key of it, but also by persuading people that the only way they can operate is by looking with suspicion on their neighbor, by falling back on sectarian, tribal, religious, family, regional uh, differences, uh, by countering that uh, in some form. Now, again, to counter it on any scale means to attract the unwelcome uh, attention of the authorities, and we know what the price of that has been. So, but nevertheless, there are ways in which one can keep that alive uh, and even uh, elusively alive uh, in ways that uh, might be of potential use in the future. So this is not in any sense a, uh, a prescription for immediate efficacy or indeed for countering the kinds of forces they're up against in the short term, but it is to leave open the possibility that of both imagining another republic is possible and also for in some senses, ensuring that the solidarities between them and others aren't simply the solidarities of familial or communal defense, which of course was one of the tragedies one might argue in Iraq under Saddam Hussein's Republic, that people fell back upon different kinds of solidarities to defend themselves quite understandably against the kind of regime that existed at the time. And we're living with the legacy of that after 2003. Great, thanks. So um, a few more questions um, to, to run through. Two questions on the younger generation uh, now. Uh, the first from Julian Dare. Um, in the, the main Middle East North Africa, where the where power is largely held and exercised by the older generation, often with a different world value. And the majority of do you see any potential for affecting a real transfer of power in different values? And then another um, question from Omar El Jumail from the University of Pavia, um, Department of Economics and Management, who asks whether youth protests in in Iraq could push the elite to modify the political order. I think I'll just leave the two, there have been um, still questions coming in, but maybe the, just these two very linked questions about the younger generation. Sorry, do I need to, I need to repeat the first question I've been told. The first question was quite broken up, but I, oh can I just say, did it seem to be about uh, what role does youth have in trying to displace the older generation from power? Yeah, the first question, yes, exactly. Because the majority of citizens are younger or of a younger generation, the elite is of the older generation. So what, what potential for real transfer of power there? Yeah, sorry about the internet. That's okay. Um, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting question because there's one of the um, uh, concerns has often been that um, to portray youth as always progressive and revolutionary. 
which of course may not be the case at all. So uh, just because you're young, it doesn't mean to say you're not conservative uh, or reactionary. Um, and I think that uh, one has seen that played itself out. So it goes back to some of the questions that were raised in the previous uh, by, by Toby, I think, was wh what proportion of the young does it represent? So clearly, if you looked at any of the countries concerned, and certainly uh, the one in West Tunisia, there are enormous differences in the class situation, in the regional situation, in the um, uh, in the political situation of young people. So you can see the that people may belong to the same generation. They may be, in that sense, have something strongly in common. Uh, but they may differ hugely in terms of their possibilities and their life chances and what they can do about it. Uh, and sometimes that breeds a very strong uh, inter-generational uh, uh, politics of contention as well. Um, so I think that there's always going to be that, as well as the fact that um, the older generation, in many of these cases, are the people with their hands on the money and the violence. So they can use both to underline the vulnerability of younger people. Um, you can use the money to create dependency. Uh, you can create the violence, use the violence uh, to create fear. Um, and in both cases, the, the vulnerability of younger people is often much greater. And so in a sense, the uh, capacity of the uh, well-entrenched older generation is more than enough sometimes to deal with the resources uh, of the of the younger ones. So again, it comes up to the to, it comes up against the same problem raised by Toby and others is that what are the means and the possibilities of resistant citizenship or insurgent citizenship under the conditions that we see now? And for uh, the youthful protesters, one of their common experiences uh, in many places has been that um, people will appreciate them, praise them, use them, and then dump, dump them, that they will be useful at a certain moment, and certainly, uh, but thereafter forgotten. And the very things that they were protesting about will be forgotten. And that the uh, class differences or regional differences amongst them will over overcome the uh, the fact that they happen to be from that generation. So I think that <clears throat> one has to be wary of the processes of socialization. To be socialized into a security state is often to be lured into complicity with the very instruments that are being used to deny full citizenship to others. And once that has been sufficiently widespread, it's quite difficult to extract extricate people from that. Uh, or to give them the capacity to stand separately and, as it were, independently and safely against those who are now complicit. So one of the features clearly of the, for instance, in Egypt, if you look at the youthfulness of the security forces that are suppressing demonstrators, um, then they are the same generation, but clearly, and maybe the same class in many cases too. Uh, they come from not dissimilar backgrounds. So I think one has to be wary of that. But again, it doesn't mean to say that by experiencing, uh, if you like, the experiences of a younger generation make, could, and the, the very experience of being neglected, being thrown aside, being marginalized has been for some a, a radicalizing experience, an experience where they no longer believe authority, they no longer trust authority. Uh, but when it comes to organizing their lives, they may need to depend upon authority and the material help that they can be given. All right, great, thanks. Uh, two final questions. Um, one a little bit more pessimistic and one perhaps with a bit of, um, bit of uh, optimism for the future in it. So the, the first from Dr. Ali Bahai Juk, sorry for mispronouncing your name. Uh, with the exception of Tunisia, do you think the Arab Spring has failed the people of the Middle East and North Africa who aspire for more democratic systems? And then from Jonathan Thrall, 
uh, what do you see as the role of the internet in reshaping debates around citizenship in the Middle East and beyond? Are current models of citizenship fit for the novel challenges of the digital era? So those will be the final two uh, questions. I think on the first one, uh, clearly the consequences of the uprisings in practically all the countries of the Middle East that experienced them in 2011 have been terrible uh, in one form or another, either civil war, breakdown, uh, reassertion of military dictatorship, um, uh, or simply uh, reoccupation of the country in military terms uh, by local forces. Um, so by contrast, therefore, Tunisia, uh, for all the unhappiness that exists within the country and the concerns about the forms of, uh, of governance that continue, um, stands out as, an, uh, as a place where people could at least begin to try and imagine realizing something closer to a Republican possibility. Um, in the other countries, not so much. And so, yes, one might argue that the aspirations of uh, 2010-11 in many of the other uh, countries of the Middle East have been dashed by the entrenchment of the regimes, but also the fragmentation of the public that I was referring to, that these things are not straightforwardly and simplify in a simplified way uh, enacted. And I think perhaps one of the problems was the ways in which the uprisings were often given this general label of the Arab Spring, as if they were the same thing in all these places. And of course they weren't. They had a lot of things in common. They saw each other as having expressing ideas in common, but they were all up against very differently constituted states and regimes. And uh, they also came from very differently constituted societies with very different histories. And in many ways, one's seen all of that playing itself out. So it could only be said to be a failure overall if you thought that the out, that the ambition was the same overall, and it wasn't. There were very different ambitions working away in different places at different times. So what you've seen has been them playing out, and uh, the results have been unhappy for many, clearly. As far as the internet is concerned, yes, I think that there was a huge amount of exaggeration in 2010-11 about the power of the internet uh, or of new social media in uh, enabling the uprisings. But what happened, in fact, was that the uprisings were probably more effectively um, uh, um, uh, developed by contact, by actual contact, rather than by that. I think what one of the things that, that one might argue, and I think it came up in relation to the question about mass public demonstrations in Lebanon and elsewhere, is that uh, clearly that is an instrument or a possibility or a platform open for people to begin to think about how to re-establish links of solidarity that aren't controlled. But one of the things one has to take into account is the fact that the internet is equally policed, uh, as policed as the public spaces in the cities themselves by the regime uh, who has often much greater resources. So the ways in which people can be tracked in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere uh, would make one quite wary about the use of that. Uh, as a form of organized opposition or organized association. And so I think in that sense, there's a real ambiguity, as one might say about the internet more generally, how much of a liberating force it has been and how much of a, of a force that one has to be quite wary of in terms of the sorts of forces that it itself has unleashed uh, and the kinds of uh, narratives that it has encouraged. So. I would still be very wary of that. I see it as an instrument, but an instrument in the hands of those who still have axes to grind of a more, of a less electronic kind, put it that way, uh, in their struggles with each other for the control of different countries and different societies in the Middle East, North Africa.
Well, what, uh, the fitting to end a Zoom uh, lecture on uh, Matters Digital, um, that was a very fitting uh, um, uh, sort of addition to the, the series of um, uh, lectures on in, mem in uh, memoriam of um, Fred Halliday, a very fitting tribute um, and a thought provoking lecture. And I'd like to thank Charles uh, very much uh, for, for giving us uh, this uh, tour de force. Um, and then um, I'd like to thank everybody for participating, for coming along and joining us. Uh, and we do hope that a recording of this will be made uh, available on our website. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us.